Welcome again and good afternoon. Uh, I would like to welcome you in this symposium organized by Zanofi Genzyme. And of course, I would like to thank Zanofi Genzyme for giving us the opportunity to share some new thoughts in multiple sclerosis clinical evaluation. And as you can, may understand from the title, uh, is it possible to improve confirmed disability in MS drugs? It is quite challenging because so far, what we know from our own experience and of course from the uh, uh, all clinical trials published so far, we were quite satisfied if the primary or secondary outcome of these studies in relation to disability progression indicated that a good percentage of patients exhibit a stabilization in their disability. We may understand that being able to have data indicating that it is not only that the disability stabilizes, but it may also improves is quite challenging and interesting. And I'm very honored and happy to be here together with my good friends and very well known to all of you, uh, scientists in the field of multiple sclerosis all around the world, Professor Andrew Chan from Switzerland and Professor Banfar Wiermersch from Belgium to share these new concepts and thoughts with you and have a debate. I will start myself with a short introduction. So can I have the first slide, please? So again, here are my disclosures. And I'm going straight to the point. We know that multiple sclerosis is a highly heterogeneous disorder which this heterogeneity involves clinical disease course, changes the, it changes the, changes the underlying pathology, patholo indicates changes in underlying pathological mechanisms during MS disease course. We know that this heterogeneity also reflects to the clinical profile of our patients, so there is a patient-specific presentation and therapeutic re response and I'm, th I'm sure that we are all convinced that the successful treatment in multiple sclerosis indicates a highly individualized process due to this reason. And of course, uh, we have noticed during the last year a changing patient population. For the time being, what we have in our hand are these traditional disease measures, but at the same time, we know the limits of these measures in matters of uh, having a reliable evaluation of our patients, either clinically or with laboratory tests. But from the clinical point of view, we all have, we know EDSS. It is a very strong clinical tool we have, but we, at the same time, we know it's, we are all aware of its limits. There is, uh, there is low sensitivity to health-related quality of life parameters. And what I used to say to my residents and students, no matter what our measurements say, what is important is what our patients may feel in matters of their quality of life. And these data are more or less missing in the vast majority of the clinical trials we have so for the, during the last 30 years. There is a high inter-rater variability, and of course this is the reason, for example, that in MS centers what we usually do from time to time is that we all together, or people who are involved in this evaluation, need again to perform some EDSS and see what is, and find out whether there are deviations from one uh, evaluation to uh, the other. And it is maybe very difficult to interpret or conduct. So there are some suggestions for new disease measures. 
such as the increase uh, which uh, have, may have increased sensitivity to symptoms or charges in underlying pathology during disease course. Uh, they may have improved predictive or diagnostic capacity and the feasibility for routine assessment and need to be translatable to clinical practice. And I think that what we have as experience and what we live in multiple sclerosis is something really fascinating, but at the same time very interesting. We have all these innovative drugs in our hands and at the same time every day or every year or from time to time we identify more and more elements from this disease that we're missing. And what we have in mind is that probably by following simply those uh, disease measures that we have in our hands, probably we are far from what, from the reality for, uh, that, is, uh, uh, that exists for our uh, patient. As we can see here throughout the years, there are a number of clinical endpoints used for MS, the MSFC, the NEDA, NEDA 2, NED, NEDA, sorry, NEDA 3, NEDA 4, and we're uh, expecting NEDA 5, NEDA 6, NEDA 7, I don't know how many NEDA, the EDSS plus, and the SAD plus, and now it has recently, recently been uh, introduced this uh, new components, the CDW and CDI, indicating the, uh, uh, in, uh, sorry, indicating as we can see here, the confirmed disability improvement and com uh, confirmed disability worsening. And let's see some uh, reasons that these two clinical components might, very be, might be very, very important and interesting. And of course, <laughs> I, I wouldn't personally, as a doctor, I wouldn't like to have to, to, to see these two new uh, uh, measures introduced recently to have the same fortune as NEDA, for example, because we talk about NEDA 4, and we all know that we are practically unable to use it and see how it works in our, uh, in our own hands. So CDI, confirmed disability improvement, is as we can see here, it describes an improvement in patients' pre-existing EDSS score maintained, maintained over a specific period of time, usually three, six, nine, 12 months assessment. And you can see here a very good example where we have a confirmed disability improvement lasting for six months in this, uh, in this uh, example. CDI is not yet a commonly used endpoint in MS clinical trials, but has been reported in some recent studies, both a priori and post hoc. So I think that, of course, this CDI, this measure, might probably help us to overcome other problems we have with the other uh, measures simply because it is resistant to transit fluctuations that may affect single time point analysis and captures an improvement in disability of sufficient magnitude and persistence to, quality of, to, to qualify as a meaningful change. And this is my last slide just to introduce you that beyond CDI we have the CDI plus and this uh, measurement com uh, composite, this novel composite endpoint encompasses measures in addition to traditional EDSS uh, scores, thereby providing a more complete picture of disability improvement. And as we can see here, we may have uh, EDSS measurements, the T25 footwalk measurements, the nine hole pack test measurements, and all three elements just uh, uh, are part of the CDI plus um, uh, component endpoint, uh, composite endpoint that has recently uh, been suggested. And of course, we have some very good results 
from the Keremets II trial where Alam Tuzumat was able to have an impact in this uh, CDI uh, plus system. So I think that it is very challenging, a very promising measure. <coughs> and most importantly, it would be, of course, very, very important to be able, we, for us as clinicians, to be able to use it from uh, to, uh, uh, regularly in order to have a better, uh, let's say, evaluation of our patients. So I am going to invite our first speaker, Andrew is, so please, and hopefully we will see from the debate we're going to have whether this new uh, uh, tool is worth using it in the future or not. Well, thank you, very, Nick, uh, for the introduction and the very thoughtful comments you had. Um, before I start, I f really feel obliged because there are so many of you sitting here with us, and in the first row we just had the discussion. I heard that the lunch will be served at 2 o'clock and there will be enough for us even if we come out a bit late. So that's my personal remark on that. So I was assigned the task to critically discuss the concept that we've just heard of cl uh, confirmed disability improvement. Um, here are my um, disclosures. What I'm going to try to discuss in a somewhat polemic way, I have to admit. And then in the end, I guess we will find a common, a common language and, and a common standpoint, Bart. Uh, what I will try to discuss are following issues. So first of all, is it not rather that we only measure recovery from relapse or in a broader sense, uh, which comes close to the discussion we had in, during the past two sessions, is it that we are sort of treating some underlying smoldering inflammation and then in the end we see some clinical efficacy. Second thing, we use EDSS mostly. What are we really measuring? And do we have any other clear surrogates which would sort of improve that measurement that is mainly based on the EDSS with all its caveats? Lastly, or last but not least, is, is, it, is it really meaningful for the quality of life? And just like as a side uh, line and as a short remark, is there any meaningful, any plausible mechanism of action? Or in other words, do we have to deal with and speak about sort of neuroprotective or even sort of regenerative mechanisms of action? or is everything really still inflammation? You've seen a similar slide before by Nick, so this is really historically how I see it. So in, in the early 90s, we were talking about the magic 30s, 30% 30 relapse rate reduction and some disability progression uh, effects. Then we uh, had the MSFC, just like to also include uh, manual function and also some cerebral cognitive function. Then we came up with the first version of NIDA, NIDA 3, Freedom of, from Disease Activity. Then you may not forget um, 2012, we had this large paper on survival under interference, also possibly a, an interesting outcome parameter. And now we're dealing with confirmed disability improvement. So do we see that? Do we see that with other substances? Do we see that with a variety of substances? Yes, we do see a signal, even in sort of real life cohorts. So that would be one large real life cohort with uh, natalizumab, Tysabri. And when you look at six months sustained, confirmed disability improvement, yes, you see something. The signal starts at 24 weeks, but this is mainly due to the observational program. They only had like six monthly intervals. One issue which I find interesting in here is that, and that you will see that during the following slides, that the slope, really, the slope of improvement is steepest 
early on. And the same holds true when you look at observational programs, real life programs, for example, with Fingolimod. Also there you see some signal, but again, the slope would be steepest early on. One thing is interesting in here. So this is the three month confirmed improvement of disability. So the, the EDSS has to be improved and then confirmed, the improvement has to be confirmed after three months. Just have a look at, the, at, at this um, orange uh, curve in here and the end point like about 25% with the odds rage, uh, ratio of about 2.8 or something. Now what happens when we not only look at three months confirmed disability improvement but rather six months confirmed disability improvement? Then the picture changes, right? Before we were here with 25%, now we're here below 20 or anything, and also the hazard ratio, the odds ratio comes down. So there is a considerable part and proportion of noise in the whole system. If you take three months or six months as a definition, that really will alter your data um, dramatically. Talking about robustness of that whole outcome parameter, so these are the data from the ocrelizumab trials, from the relapsing uh, remitting trials, the OPERA 1 and 2 studies. When you look at uh, combined data, pooled data from both of these trials, yes, you see a uh, effect in favor of ocrelizumab when it comes to confirmed disability improvement. However, when you look in, in more detail, what you can observe is similar to the studies we did have on confirmed disability worsening, that not all the studies which were performed in a parallel fashion and where, which were very similar show the same results. Because in one of these OPERA trials, you did see an effect on clinical, um, uh, clinically and confirmed disability improvement, and in the other, you just did not see anything. Only if you pooled the data, then it becomes statistically significant again. So this sort of gives you an, an idea of the rob on, on the robustness of the data we're looking at. Now, Nick mentioned this trial, the KRMS2 trial, and we will hear about that a bit later. Also here we see some efficacy, so the slope again may be somewhat, be relatively steep early on. However, there's a clear difference um, uh, after 24 months in favor of alimtuzumab, more patients uh, had clinically confirmed disability improvement after two years on alimtuzumab than on interferon beta 1a. But here comes the issue. Also, 13% of interferon beta treated patients had an improvement. And be aware, this is the study of the patients which were selected for being non um, uh, non-responders to previous uh, brace treatments, to previous first-line treatments. So among these patients are some patients at least, or many patients, who in terms of relapses would not have uh, um, um, benefited from interferon beta 1a. So now telling these patients um, or understanding or trying to understand that a part of these patients still after two years had an improvement of their disease is somewhat difficult to understand biologically, isn't it? And there comes another issue, and that's an issue to which Nick also mentioned before. So how about communication? So far in the past decades, we communicated to our patients it's about stability. We try, it's not get it, we try that it's not getting worse. Now, if I tell my interferon beta patient, you know, you have a certain likelihood that it becomes better. I tell you many patients will come back and say, doctor, you told me you promised it's going to be better. Now I have the side effects. I don't feel better. I have much more fatigue. I'll drop it. I'm not going to do it anymore. So my adherence rates will drop down considerably. So it's also an issue on how we discuss these aspects with our <laughs> patients. Now, coming back to this issue, you know, that even in interferon beta non-responders, we see a 
certain proportion where we can at least calculate a clinical improvement of um, disability, how robust is that really? So this is a very old study where these authors, George Evers, um, they took uh, the placebo arms of 31 randomized clinical co uh, um, uh, controlled trials, like the typical pivotal trials. And they looked at the likelihood of an improvement after three months, six months or no interval versus a clinical deterioration. Again, after no interval, three months or six months. So confirmed after three, six months. And what they could observe, at least in the placebo arms, was the likelihood to become worse of clinical worsening was just as high as the likelihood to improve. So what does that tell us about both of these uh, outcome measures? So the authors concluded that they think that in these short-term trials, uh, at least in the relapsing remitting patients, that uh, we rather see a lot of noise, random variation, uh, measurement area, and also remission of relapses. Duration of the trials is a highly important issue. In the late 90s, we did have some rheumatological agents where we thought like in active MS, wow, they have a clear benefit over two years. But the arms closed after three and four years. So be aware, there's a, there's a caveat when we only look at one or even two year data. And then I mentioned, you know, um, what are we really looking at? We're looking at EDSS, aren't we? You all know the caveats of the EDSS. So we talk about disability, yes, but we also talk about activity and something like motivation, which we cannot measure really. We have a strong focus on motor function, which also tells us that there are some EDSS ranges where this, uh, where this scale is very insensitive, and it's, of course, not linear. And then there's another issue which, we, which is well known. So that in natural history, the interval, the time that you spend at an individual level varies. So, you know, there may be a higher likelihood to clinically improve or worse, wor uh, uh, become worse uh, at certain EDSS stages just due to the uh, sheer measure measurement. And finally, as we heard before, there's a high degree of inter-rater variability, 0 0.5 EDSS points. And then come these data, the phase two data, which were highly discussed uh, the phase two data for alemtuzumab, where we saw some improvement of EDSS uh, for the alemtuzumab um, arm and some worsening for the interferon beta 1a arm. But then again, having in mind that we have an interrater variability of 0 0.5, what does that really mean if we have a change of 0 0.17 for alemtuzumab or 0 0.24? and then try to translate that into something clinical. What is, when you have a ba baseline EDSS of around two to three, what, what does that really mean? How can I, uh, you know, as an EDSS rater, I wouldn't be able to describe that clinically. I wouldn't be able to, to envisage a picture with a patient. So um, there's one other, there are some other things here with the, with this, um, with the Keramis 1 and 2 trials. We do see clinical uh, improvement, and we will hear about that a bit later by Bart. Uh, here again, it appears that the, the, the curves tend to diverge over time, which gives an idea that maybe in this trial, this data may be somewhat more robust in comparison to what we've heard before and what I've demonstrated before. But still, again, there are some questions which I have which I cannot easily answer. So this is down here. Of the patients in the CARAMES2 who achieved a six months um, disability improvement at year six, 94% were free from six month confirmed disability worsening. So that's interesting. 
So that means not all of the patients had an improvement all the time, but there may be other fluctuations, six month fluctuations. So they may have a, a sort of like um, phase where they become worse and they have a phase where they become better again. So that really again questions uh, somewhat the robustness of our findings or you have to give me some other biological rationale for that. Now, what does that mean for our patient? What does an EDSS of 2.75 mean for our patient? I don't really know too well. So there are some issues, you know, which are related um, with our MSFC measures, for example, to some clinical, not only quality of life issues, but some, you know, clinically meaningful and uh, meaningful uh, outcome markers even for, for, uh, for our patients. So, for example, when you have a, uh, um, 25 foot walk test below six seconds, then the likelihood that you still have your normal job is very high. But if it increases above six seconds, then it, it may well be that you have to change your job. And it's even clearer when, when you come up to like um, uh, above uh, eight seconds or something, then the likelihood that you have to entirely change your occupation due to walking disability is highly clear. What I did not understand in that, in that table was this in here. So the likelihood, the, the slower you walk, the mo more likely it is that you are divorced. Maybe you can explain that to me a bit later, but this is um, difficult. One issue I wa also wanted to bring up, I personally I don't find it difficult, but um, there are reviewers who find it difficult, is this issue on blinding. So you know that the alamtuzumab trials, the KMS1 and KMS2 trials were not double dummy designed, which is in my opinion just not possible. How can you with 90% infusion reactions on alamtuzumab and with flu-like reactions on interferon beta, how can you in real world design a double dummy design? But still there are sort of puristic people who discuss that. The point I'm trying to make is yes, we always have to bear in mind that that may also have an issue on the robustness of our findings when they relate to EDSS because a lot of things may also be related to um, motivation as I mentioned. So coming to the end, my critic points were like these. In essence, really, I don't believe we are, we are only looking at recovery from relapse. But you know, to make the data more robust, it would be beautiful to have a clinical rebaselining or to reanalyze the data with some rebaseline, wouldn't it? So the EDSS, we will hear from Bard about like you know how we can improve EDSS measurements, and we heard about CDI plus. I really believe this is the way to go, to exclude really the potential confounders. And we really need to strive for more surrogates. We've heard about OCT, if it had some, some reflection in MRI or whatever, that would be beautiful and that would make it easier for me to discuss that with my patients. And then in the end, really, uh, it would be beautiful to demonstrate to the patient what does that really mean to you. Is there any plausible mechanism of action? I don't know, I, I would love to hear from Bart. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. And now I invite Bart for his presentation. By the way, Bart is the president of Paradigms, for those who don't know it. And we are doing great job there, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nico. Thank you. Matters of educational activities. So I expect that your presentation would be also an educational one. Well, I hope so. Um, thank you, Nico. Thank you, Andrew, for uh, these nice introductions and, and, and points of views. And um, I hope to try and uh, show you that it is possible to improve uh, confirmed disability um, with MS drugs um, and these are my disclosures um, and I, 
if, if there's one thing I do agree already with, with Andrew, that is that we have to try and objectively measure uh, neurological functioning rather than using uh, EDSS scores, um, which can fluctuate and inter-rater differences, and certainly in the higher EDSS scores is sometimes that you see a patient really improving and is not changing anything on his EDSS or the other way around. His EDSS fluctuates a little bit over six months, uh, which not maybe not really mean a, 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 a real improvement. So you have structural correlates of uh, measuring neurological uh, functioning, which is most popular is MRI of the brain. Uh, for example, brain atrophy is maybe a summary of all things. If, if brain volume loss is uh, prevented, uh, that would be mean that maybe uh, you are preserving brain. When you preserve uh, the brain from new T2 or T1 lesions, uh, less black holes, that means that you're preserving brain. That should do something good for the patient. But maybe more modern and sensitive techniques might be optical coherence uh, tomography, the ret retinal or fiber layer thickness. Uh, might be interesting to know what is happening with the axons itself, where we can assess them directly. But also functional correlates. It's, it's not enough to see uh, less brain shrinkage or uh, less shrinkage of the net retinal nerve fiber. It's also to see whether um, these, these uh, functions, are they getting better motor function, visual function, and, and other functional systems that we can measure? Uh, are these neurons getting better? Then maybe it, it will end up in patients being better. So let's start with um, uh, the first one, um, optical coherence tomography and disability and, and, and what is known, uh, what, what, what we can f see by it. Um, for the ones who were here in, in the morning sessions also, they have already saw beautiful presentations on what is optical coherence tomography and what is it measuring. Um, you have a lot, the, the axons of the ganglion cells, um, um, they are unmyelinated and they come together and they form the optical nerve uh, where they are myelinated. And this layer is the retinal nerve fiber layer. And um, what we know from it is that um, it correlates very well with increasing of brain atrophy, the decrease of the retinal nerve fiber layer uh, is very much in a correlation. And we know that brain atrophy and OCT measurements correlate very well with disability of these patients. So this patient uh, has a high, a, a, a lower brain parenchymal fraction and uh, a smaller uh, retinal nerve fiber layer thickness than the, the one here. And also this EDSS will be higher. Um, so let's see what treatment uh, can mean for uh, OCT measurements. For example, here a study with patients before they, uh, with not on fingolimod and on fingolimod, and, and uh, the measurement was about six months apart. So uh, with about 30 patients with 60 eyes, 60 measurements, and is there is a significant uh, increase in the, um, uh, the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness already quite fast. So you might say it's, it's too fast and, and you might say it's only relapses, recovery, but it's seen uh, as well in eyes that are, have optic neuritis as well as they haven't been affected by optic neuritis. And also uh, in another study, uh, it's a prospective study of retinal nerve fiber layer thickness in uh, alentuzumab treated patients. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a poster. Um, that has been presented in, in the Matter Academy uh, last year. Um, and I will show you some details on that in the next slide, is that you see not only EDSS improving um, over two years, which is not surprising and not so much more of change than was seen in the MS Care 1 and 2 trials, but what you see is that that retinal nerve fiber layer is increasing rather than decreasing over two years' time, um, which is highly significant. And it's not only for the eyes that had optic neuritis, but also for the eyes that were not affected by optic neuritis. 
So here you see that for the individual patients, optic neuritis eyes improve, but also the non-optic neuritis it tries. So it's, it's uh, probably not due to recovery from a relapse that they are improving here. So that might mean that alentuzumab has mechanisms to prevent neurodegeneration uh, in both eyes. Okay, that's one structural measurement. Um, the one I find very important is functional measurements because it's, it's maybe a way of saying quality of life is, is, is what it needs. It's also a kind of functional measurement rather than a structural MRI uh, improvement. So evoke potential as an indicator of confirmed disability improvement. And first let's see what do we measure. Uh, let's first look at um, motor evoked potentials. Um, for those who are not familiar with that, motor evoked potentials is you use transcranial magnetic stimulation. So a magnetic coil is placed above the scalp of the patient and you perform a small uh, magnetic field above the cortex. On the cortex, it will lead to a normal depolarization of the neurons so that are from the pyramidal tract, of course, in the motor part. The pyramidal tract crosses and goes to the lower motor neuron and then you have a contraction of the muscle that, I, I, that you stimulated. And this is with an EMG surface mar, uh, uh, electrodes. You can measure the amplitude, the latency, the time it took to get to that uh, hand. And here you see the latency and here you see the amplitude and also the form plays a role. So the latency, this is for, for a thumb muscle, the abductor pollicis brevis muscle. This is the muscle of your thumb. Normally it takes about 20 milliseconds to get there. There's one peak, is there one stimulus? There is one peak, not, not dispersion, and there is a high amplitude. So that's a normal response of your muscle. Um, for, for example, visual evoked potentials, maybe we're m more familiar with that. The patient closes, has to close one eye and look at the center of a monitor with a, a red dot there and the black and white uh, surface will change. So we get a pattern shift. And then the, uh, at the occipital lobe, uh, scalp electrodes are placed and you can see what is the summarized uh, amplitude and, and, and um, curve. And this is the left eye which has a normal curve with a P100 latency of about 100 milliseconds, and this eye, it's delayed by about 20 milliseconds, which says, okay, this is a, 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 a demyelinated uh, uh, optic nerve, so that means that um, there has been uh, damage. So, we, we, and what we know from these evoked potentials is that they correlate very well with disability of a patient. In terms of EDSS, there is a highly correlation in the global EP score is if you take motor, somatosensory, brainstem, uh, and visual evoked potentials, and you all score them with uh, abnormality, and an abnormality just gets a point, and when it's normal, it's just zero, and when you all count them together, you have a global EP score. Well, that global EP score correlates very well with disability. But not only that, it's one of the, the, the best prognostic markers apart from your clinics and your MRI. If you want to do a prognosis of a patient and you want to know what is his functional reserve, you have to do evoke potentials. And it shows that uh, at, at diagnosis, if your EP scores are higher with especially motor and sensory uh, have the most uh, value in there, but if the global EP score is high, then these patients will worsen over five years' time, uh, uh, clinically worsen. They have much higher chance, so their functionally reserve is more disabled. Uh, so let's see what treatment can do about this functional reserve, about these functionalities. This is a, a study with patients on uh, natalizumab. 44 relapsing remitting patients one year before and one year after treatment with natalizumab. And you see that uh, when you see um, uh, patients worsening, no change or improving in their EDSS scores, you see that before the number of patients being stable or improving uh, their uh, EDSS 
and uh, motor evoked potential correlates very much. So if they have an improvement in EDSS scores, they also have an improvement in uh, functional measurements. Yeah. Um, we have done this with our cohort of uh, uh, alentuzumab treated patients, though so this is still unpublished. We're working on a manuscript um, uh, as we speak. Um, and w what we did is we took about uh, 37 patients with a mean follow-up of four years. The longest follow-up of patients is seven years. Um, and the, the shortest follow-up is about one year after two doses. So we only included patients that had a full uh, treatment of two cycles. Um, you, well, there are some more females, of course, um, mean age 30 years. And the mean EDSS is three and a half with, of course, some higher, six and seven patients there. Um, what is here, what you can see here is that there is improvement over six to seven years in these patients, which is, which is highly significant over the mean. Um, and when you calculate the confirmed disability improvement at six months, you can see that at seven years follow-up, about 38% of them have six months confirmed disability improvement, which correlates quite good with uh, the data from the, from the CARE-MS 1 and 2, where we saw that not only in the first two years, but only I also in the next year, and even in up to six and seven years' time after being treated, patients are still improving. Now, is that something we see uh, with objective measures of f electrophysiology, is that something we see? Well, yes, here you see the change in motor evoked potential um, uh, lat uh, latency in patients uh, from the, the, the legs, so the abductor hallucis, which is the muscle in the foot. And these are, uh, in the, at the left side, you see patients that had abnormal values to start with, so they can improve or get worse. And these are the right side are patients with normal values which they started with, so they only can uh, uh, worsen and not improve. And here you see in red the ones that did improvement, and improvement is more than five milliseconds improvement. Here you see some patients doing much more than this. Uh, and there's only one that had improvement, uh, that had worsening over more than up to seven years in patients. So, 35% uh, had an improvement, 60% stabilization, and when they started normal, uh, it's, it's logic, but when they started normal, they remain normal. The same is seen when you take uh, VAP latencies, that when they started abnormal, up to 15% improves, and uh, most of them remain stable. And uh, improvement even is seen in, in when they started normal, because um, sometimes even there we, we, we see some improvement of more than 5 to 10 milliseconds. So that means that there is a um, structural correlate of um, people um, uh, improving clinically that uh, when you see them improvement, and I might say, give you just one example of one patient. Um, of course, this is not representative for every patient in the group, but I think this is a very good example to see what kind of difference we can see or we can measure not only in a, f a short term follow up but also a long term follow up. This is, a, uh, this is a, an 18 year old female which was treated um, when she had an EDSS of 4.5 um, at baseline. And this is a very bad. Um, um, motor evoked potential of the abductor hallucis muscle. You've seen uh, the normal uh, flow here. Normally it should be 40 millisecond, which is about in the middle of the curve here. It should be a high amplitude, a one. And what you see is a very low amplitude, a very dispersed uh, answer of, of the leg. So you see this is devastating. This is one month before. This is nine months after the fir uh, after alentuzumab treatment, the first cycle. What you see is, okay, this is much better. The amplitude gets up, and 
and it's it's a big difference. And you might say, okay, this is remyelination after a relapse. Of course, this is remyelination after a relapse. We're still only one year behind. But still, this is 10, 20, 30, 40. This is about 55, 55 or, uh, milliseconds. And normally, she should be below 40 milliseconds to be normal. So this is far from normal. When you look two years down the road, you see it improving. Yeah? The, 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 40, the 50 milliseconds go up to 40 milliseconds. And even in this quite disturbed answer, you, you find something improvement. And now five years down the road, I can tell you this one is almost a normal value. If you look at here, it's the same, um, the same um, milliseconds, the same plot here. So this jumped to there, so you have about 20 milliseconds faster. 20 milliseconds is 50% of the latency. Um, and here also you see for the right uh, leg a big improvement. So it's not, it's not unfair to say that this patient kept on improving over more than five years, and she went from an EDSS of 4.5 to an EDSS of 1.5. She's running now, whether there she had to use a cane to be able to walk for 20 meters uh, without falling. So there's a big difference. Um, and so... The question is, what mechanisms are we, are we looking at? Um, there is structural repair and functional repair. Um, and, 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 and what I believe the most is that when we inhibit CNS inflammation, this may provide an environment, this may allow an environment that has better uh, chances for the endogenous remyelination and repair mechanisms that are present. And, um, one of the things we observed in our uh, study um, now is that when we look at patients that had really bad evoked potentials and had uh, a little bit longer disease duration, so uh, then the, 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 the chance of ha having clinically improvement and improvement on, on functional evoked potential measurements uh, is much lower than with this 18-year-old female where you come in very early then the, the, the potential for repair is much higher, which is logic, but it's, it's nice to show it. Neurotrophic factors have been um, shown to be secreted by CNS traffic in immune cells, uh, and you might postulate that this might also enhance endogenous repair mechanisms. So the question is out there how it works, but I'm really convinced that uh, not only for short term, but in very long term, especially when we come in early with a highly active medication, we can functionally restore uh, neurons and axons in these patients. Uh, so with that, there are only some backups, I see. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bert. Uh, well, I think that we are on time, it's amazing, although there was a little delay uh, in d uh, when we start this uh, satellite symposium. So are there any questions from the audience? The panel is open for discussion. Professor Kotzin. If you allow me, you better use the microphone so everybody can hear you. So, so the question, the question, my question really relates to this uh, recovery, this, which is interesting and, and impressive. Um, I'm less impressed with the uh, electrophysiological data because I don't know what they mean and whether it's a regression towards the mean or something else. But if there is clinical recovery and also electrophysiological recovery, they should correlate. So I think uh, it would be interesting to see if the patients who respond clinically, who improve clinically, also have the same uh, or have better uh, manifestations uh, there. And if, uh, to the extent that there, uh, there is, it's, it's impressive. If there isn't, then we should think about what, are, what makes the differences. And the other question I have is that you, um, you were um, emphasizing the remuneration. In peripheral nerve injury, 
remuneration is much faster than axonal recovery. And if you show here that the, uh, that the recovery in visual, visual responses or motor take a year or two years, then why do you say that this is necessarily remuneration rather than axonal improvement? Well, thank you. These are very good questions. Uh, in terms of your first uh, a question on, on the part of correlation between clinics and, and the functional scores, uh, of course, I haven't had, had the time to go into that, but certainly the, the first study on natalizumab really shows that. And uh, the, in our cohort, uh, there is a high correlation between uh, patients ha that have clinical improvement and, and seeing EVO potentials uh, uh, better. It's not a hundred percent because sometimes you see some improvement in evoke potentials but the patient is not feeling that but then you might get uh, kind of reassuring that the patient is kind of doing well uh, but there is a high correlation and, and I hope to publish that in the in the next months and, and I hope others will uh, as well be engaged to do that because I think it's it's very important. Um, uh, in terms of, of the second question, um, what was it? It was, uh, axonal yes, axonal versus demyelination. Um, um, well, in terms of electrophysiology, um, it's, there is some debate about the technique that you use and the, 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 how hard you can um, say something about axonal uh, time. What we do is um, we use... Um, um, super maximal stimulation and very standardized where then it's believed that you can tell something about um, increasing of the amplitude but, but the best outcomes are only seen with triple stimulation tests which are technically very uh, uh, hard to do and it's not existent for for lower legs for example so the best we can do is do sub maximal uh, stimulations so that's why my my statement is more firm towards latency shifts, which are believed to be more demyelinating. Uh, but um, of course, it's 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 probably something of both. We 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 don't. It's it's an assumption rather than than make, being sure what is um, um, restoring. It might also be a little bit compensation, of course, neuroplasticity, but. Um, there is more research on that and what is really changing. Maybe just, <clears throat> just two thoughts on, 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 on what you've said. Um, so what I gather from here is that, that I like the concept really, but I like it scientifically because it gives us new ideas. That even, you know, when we thought there's some fixed disability, there's, there's something wh which we can modulate by whatever mechanism, by whatever agent, it doesn't really matter, so that helps me. But uh, what I really find difficult is to translate that down to the individual patient level. I like your approach with the, with the evoked potentials. We see that on an individual patient level. I see the patient is clinically doing worse, but EPs remain the same and vice versa. Be and, and there's some, some sort of time lag in, in, either, in either direction. So. You know, I, I find it um, somewhat difficult, but clearly this, this is um, for me the way to go. One question I have for you also with regards on remyelination, axonal damage, or the simple things like this resolution of conduction block. Do you have a particular phase in your cohort where you saw the most, the, the hi highest degree of improvement electrophysiologically? Uh, electrophysiologically, um, I think that the, the, the biggest, as you saw in the, in the example, the biggest improvement is in the first two years, and then, and but, but then it's it's almost surprisingly that in 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 it's not only this patient but in a few other patients, it's quite surprising that um, they keep on improving in their electrophysiology towards n almost normal levels, uh, while the patient at that point is saying. I'm doing fine, and in EDSS of, of 1.5, it, it, yeah, it has to improve quite a bit to ever get to zero. Of course, it's, it, at that point, you don't pick it up probably anymore. But it's a quite big reassurance that the, 
the disease process seem to have stopped and that you're not losing reserve anymore. It's like saying, okay, I don't see brain atrophy anymore, or I get reassured that I'm sparing some brain in the long term, that, and in the long term that can only be good. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying, okay, this is, I'm more reassured about the NIDA. And I do agree with you that we don't pick up everything because we do a lot of electrophysiology research also in, in progressive patients. And in some patients, you have to wait two years before the, the, the evoked potentials are changing and while the patient is already progressing for two years. In other patients, you see it quite fast, and there is a, a bottom effect, of course. Um, so we have to learn m better ways. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that um, we are able, and, and I, I also believe in, in the, the concept of the, the therapeutic window. It's also a therapeutic window where you probably can see improvement and when, when the damage is too far gone or when the lesion is too much gliosis <coughs> where, where repair is not possible anymore and then you probably won't pick it up and then you have to do rehabilitation and techniques. So we're now looking maybe at selecting some patients where you can say, okay, you have a profile that you have a high chance of improvement. You have a profile that we our biggest aim is stabilizing your disease, and that would be nice because in communication, that's important. Uh, if you say, oh, in the mean, 30% of patients have a chance of improvement, they will come back to you and say, as you said, you promised I, I would be better and I'm not, and that's not fair to say. Bart, if you allow me, just uh, sorry for the interruption. Well, evoked potentials are very important, but I think that they are vulnerable to a matter of factors from temp environmental temperature, whatever. Well, I think that for the time being, what we need to give to the audience today is a clear message from the clinical point of view, because we are clinicians, whether the CDI may or may not be a reliable um, ev evaluation tool that we may use in the future, because there, there was, there, there's still been a huge discussion even for NEDA, NEDA 3, NEDA 4, and even for Rio score or whatever. And I can hardly imagine how many, how, how uh, reasonable is this? I mean, how, I mean, uh, real it is, it is for our um, reality, everyday clinical reality. So a clear question, do you think, to both of you, do you think that CTI has a fortune in our clinical practice, or is it going to be another factor for clinical studies among the various drugs trying to identify percentages of uh, responders to this uh, factor? What do you think? The second, um, I believe it's going to be improved in clinical studies. We're going to learn more of the different associations and, and what it really means for the patient. Until then, it will take some time un before we can take it back to the real patient level, to the individual patient. Uh, However, patient. this last comment for my, for my point of view, for the time being, I think there is a good scientific rationale for this. Although it was, for the first time I heard it, I was really positively surprised, but when the other data we are aware uh, of uh, that came from, re uh, the, uh, from research where they identified the neurotrophin re um, uh, secretion from the uh, T cells or the inflammatory cells under the, uh, of at least for those exposed to alentuzumab or the BDNF, CNTF, etc. And most importantly, from my, at least according to my opinion, the fact that alentuzumab was able to control EAE even, uh, even after the induction of this, of this, uh, uh, um, of, the, of, of EAE. Actually, this is our biggest nightmare whenever we submit a paper with EAE. The first thing that reviewers ask is not make a pretreatment, do not treatment during induction, what is the effect of your drug or your compound after the induction. So I think that there are clearly good scientific uh, rationale for the CDI. Uh, what is your opinion on this? Is there 
and good still and very uh, well supported, let's say. Is this a well supported concept, not only from the clinical point, but also from the uh, scientific point of view? I, I think um, if, we, if we really want to do something good for the patient, and, and, and I would just want to comment, if you just look at the clinical side, it must be our goal to get patients better. And, uh, and not only in the short term, but I think CDI is only something to say in the long term, because in the short term it will be recovery from relapse. And in the, sh in the long term, it should be that it's maintained, that people are quality of life. And however you men measure it, is it EDSS or quality of life or some other uh, CDI plus measurement, it should be maintained over a very long period and then we are doing something good. And then probably we are convinced, this will, then probably we, we have changed something in the, in the repair mechanisms in, 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 in the disease itself uh, because our brain has a lot of potential to be plastic and to repair. So it's scientifically very interesting when to hit the disease and what is the, res uh, what is the possibility there. From a clinical point of view, I think we need long-term um, confirmation of that we are getting patients clinically better and that it's not only relapse. And recovery. just the last provocative question, and I would like to have the answer within the next 15 seconds because Professor Kotzin is gonna kill me. We are supposed to go for lunch. Do you believe that there is any possibility that CDI might become a criterion for non-responders versus responders? As a part of, of a composite outcome, yes. Thank you. I hope so too, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, all of you, for being with us. And bon appetit.